Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. We are joined by Marissa White, who is currently the Director of Revenue Operations at Perkbox, but has approximately 12 years in the, game, in the sales ops game, previously has sales experience and also worked at Accenture, where I used to work, um, and also in, in the last three or four years has built up her own kind of sales operations with practice and media sites. So, Marissa, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, let's kick off right away, like 12, those 12 years ago, how did you initially get into sales operations? Um, so my story is, is a bit of, um, the business trip that never ended. <laughs> so, um, I was at the time working for Accenture and I was working on a, um, a project with some sales organizations amongst some other, um, and we finished the project. It was all great. I was living in the States. Um, and I was, um, being told that the client needed some more support. Um, they'd had someone go off, um, who was kind of working in the operations space and could I fill in for her for three months? Um, so I got on a plane to London a couple of days later, um, and I kind of never left. So that's both how I moved to London um, from New York and also kind of how I got into sales operations. So it was meant to be a three-month project that, that really never ended. Got it. So, so you were seconded to the client, I assume? I was. I was. And you um, stayed with the client? And eventually I said, you know, it would be really great if we just paid me in pounds and I actually lived in London like a real person. (laughs) Mm. Um, And I I really enjoyed what I was doing. So um, by the time it got to that point, it had been that this three-month initial engagement um, had really kind of extended to to nine months. And so by that point, um, you know, I kind of had um, a team of people that that I had kind of pulled together that were kind of working in, in sales operations and and essentially, um, you know, was already kind of doing the job, which which I really kind of enjoyed. Got it. So, so you're like, by Accenture, I'm going to work with a client. Yes, it's a little bit more complicated than that, <laughs> the divorce process, but yeah. essentially, yes. Okay, fair enough. And this was, this was in 2007? Um, yeah. Got it. And then since then, I can, like, approximately, I'm seeing, like, you, well, all you, your exposure to sales organizations it probably ranks in like 10 to 20 or even more right yes yeah, so i think um in terms of kind of full-time roles um i've kind of you know worked at five different organizations and i've been um you know through my consulting business able to kind of touch a number of other organizations um some of them is very kind of short engagements and some of those in kind of more depth so really getting a feel for um you know how things work most of my kind of um, you know, proper roles, if you will, full-time roles, have really been in the software and SaaS space. Um, and so that's really where my expertise lies. But what I was able to do kind of through consulting was actually be exposed to another, a number of other industries, um, which has been fascinating. And, and I think some of the lessons that I've learned, um, I've kind of been able to bring back to software and SaaS. And as you look at different industries, um, there are things that they do really, really well and things that you think, gosh, that's in the dark ages. Um, so, so yeah, it's been quite interesting seeing um, just how different people do things. Got it. And if we zoom in today onto Perkbox, so you're currently director of revenue operations. What is the approximate size of the sales organization? Well, actually, I, I assume you're spread across maybe marketing, sales, and support. Um, yeah, so my role, um, my role, I kind of work with uh, marketing, sales, and the customer success organizations, um, cool. and so we kind of consider those really our our commercial, our kind of go to market audience. So um, you know, if you combine the audiences from kind of all three of them, I mean, it's well over half the company. Um, in terms of kind of bag carrying, quota carrying um, salespeople, it's probably more like um you know 40 to 50 people got it 40 to 50 and then how many people in the rev ops or well, the operations team that span those three areas yep so we've got um we've got five people so we've got someone who looks after kind of top of the funnel um in more of an operation space we've got someone who looks after more bottom of the funnel and customer success again in the operation space 
Um, we've got two data analysts and we also have someone working in enablement um, and kind of sales enablement. But for us, it's kind of just revenue, customer and, you know, uh, facing enablement. Awesome. Um, zooming in on the 40 to 50 credit carriers, what's something that you've done recently that has, or not recently, but at some point since you've been there, about eight, nine months, um, that's boosted their productivity? Um, so one thing that um, was really important when I came in, um, you know, I had a look and it was really difficult for me to understand where things were in the pipeline. Um, there were a number of different stages and, and things that I'd kind of go around and go, hey, what does the stage mean? And everyone go, no one knows. Um, and so what was really tough um, was actually getting managers to, to coach reps and really knowing where their deals were, so how they could help them. And so um, whilst a project to kind of harmonize sales methodology and stages might not at the surface be connected to productivity, I think for them, it's it's let our managers have a much better view of where things are um, and how they can coach things and how they can kind of get rid of deals that, that aren't really moving and, and aren't really progressing and really kind of, you know, create the right coaching and, and feedback loop for things that can be kind of moved along. So um, for us, it's kind of led to a much cleaner pipeline, which I suppose in effect means that reps are working on less deals, but hopefully they're the good deals that that we feel like we can win. Got it. So did you actually change the different pipeline stages? We did. We changed everything from kind of lead through opportunity. Um, and most of them weren't kind of huge shifts. Um, they were mostly around defining. So if you ask five different people and no one knows what this stage means, it's probably not that hard to change. The one thing that probably was the biggest shift is um, we kind of changed that line between where SDRs were handing off leads and where opportunities um, were created and kind of working on sales. And so when I came in, that was something that the balance was heavily skewed towards SDRs working quite late through the sales cycle. Um, and what that meant is things were kind of sitting as leads for you know, more than half of our actual sales cycle, um, making it very hard to actually know where they were or how much they might be. Um, and so that ownership over, you know, if there's next steps, if it is an opportunity, um, that's firmly kind of sitting with a with a sales audience, with an AE. And so that kind of handover and, and where in the sales cycle that handover, that was probably the biggest change. The, um, the naming and the rest of it, um, was probably the first step towards adding more rigor around that, but it probably wasn't a huge shift. Got it. And so was, was there a rationale for having the SDRs so involved up until that late stage in the process, or had that just like drifted over time? I think it had drifted over time. It was um, it was actually really fascinating because uh, I'd never seen anything like it. So, um, you know, normally it's, it's, it's normal to kind of see um, sales, um, sales are the quarterback, sales are the leaders. And, and um, you know, it's clear that they're running things and, and in that relationship between an SDR and sales, sales is, is the more senior audience. Um, what we were finding is actually the SDRs were the ones pushing sales to push things along. And if anything, they were almost kind of driving these things up until the very last stages. And so we didn't want to take that away because it's great that we had an audience that were you know, not throwing things over the fence and really kind of taking ownership and moving things along. Um, but of course, the longer that they're moving things along, the less that they have to either find, um, you know, new leads or or find time to qualify um, different inbound leads. So I think, um, yeah, we didn't want to take that away from them because they are a very kind of proactive audience. Um, but yeah, the, the balance was probably unlike anything I'd ever seen. Got it. Um, and so when you made that change and I assume pushed that line back a bit, um, was there anything that you did to help uh, smooth that process in or, or help people get help get the reps and the SDRs or into this new way of doing things? Uh, do you have any tips around doing that? Um, so one of my kind of um, first exposures into kind of project management and things um, was kind of back at Accenture and, and the project that brought me into to sales ops. Um, my role was around business readiness. 
Um, and so it's probably the part of projects that most often gets missed. Um, and business readiness is really kind of readying the business, readying people for change. And so um, like part of that is communication and communication and communication. Um, and part of that is training and documentation. Um, part of that is kind of support after the fact. And so even kind of making those big changes, it was the first time that that I think Perkbox had really, uh, especially in the commercial organization, had had that kind of rigor of here's what's coming. Um, you know, we've we've now rolled this out with some power users. We've tested it. We've got feedback. We've gone back. We've adjusted our training material. Um, we've kind of come up with examples. We're doing this in a staging environment. Um, we've got test scripts for people to run through. Not test scripts, but more like, um, you know, we're going to step through what you're going to do with a lead. So click here and do this. And, you know, now in a deal, you click here and do this. And so we did a lot of prep in terms of not just telling people what was coming, but really walking them through the change. Um, whereas I think in the past, that probably would have been like an hour long session and here are the new things and kind of here you go um, off to the races. And so um, I think, you know, all these kinds of changes that people want to make in operations and, you know, they want to change Salesforce to do something or create a new process, all that stuff's actually quite easy. It's, it's changing people that's hard. So um, trying to kind of make that as, organized and professional and, and repeatable as possible. So got it. I mean that sounds like it sounds like a classic like startup where previously some ops manager was just like pushing stuff through versus like a actual business change process that you can only or the best place to learn those is at the large consulting companies, right? And so it seems like you brought that more structured, organized approach to a startup. Yeah, absolutely. And and it was new. Um, you know, and, and my team even, you know, is is that was kind of a very new thing for them. And I think um what's been great is we've then been able to kind of take that approach to some other more recent projects that we've done. So something that we also did in Q4 was kind of um roll out inside view, which is really kind of a um data provider for us around um both account and contact information. So we had really limited um, firmographic information around our customer base, um, which meant that we weren't really good at knowing, um, you know, where our sweet spot was, which also then makes it very difficult to know with our prospects who are kind of most likely to buy. So that same sort of approach of kind of, um, you know, introducing that to a small number of people, getting some feedback, putting together some proper training sessions and follow-up, um, sessions, monitoring the adoption, continuing to kind of communicate doing all that rather than just here's our training happy days um and going on got it and while we're on that uh, what if the the rest of the sales tech stack at perkbox so we have the inside view i'm gonna hazard a guess you guys are using salesforce um i'm a salesforce junkie never again with dynamics That's all <laughs> no. I'll say. um you know which is not to say i think um hubspot has is a really good place for um, quite small businesses starting out. Um, and I think Salesforce can sometimes be a bit overkill, but um, outside of HubSpot and Salesforce, those are probably my two <laughs> thumbs up. But yeah, we're, we're a Salesforce shop. Um, you know, on the front end, in terms of marketing automation, um, we use Marketo. Um, we also use Chili Piper to do some meeting bookings. Um, we have an audience that use Outreach. Um, you know, most specifically, probably our, our outbound SDR team. Um, I mentioned we use Inside View. Um, for some of our account managers, um, we use a tool called Groove. There's a lot of things out there. It basically just does email and meeting tracking. Um, so it's almost like a really uh, quite s simple version of, of um, doing that tracking. Um that's probably the main things. I'm sure I'll think of something afterwards, but that's kind of what our stack looks like. Awesome. Um, and we use LinkedIn, of course. Sales Navigator, of course. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, cool. The sales forecasting process, um, how is that currently working? So um, not well, if I'm, <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> um, and certainly something that, that we're working to get better. So... I mentioned, you know, we worked on this effort that rolled out in October um, around introducing some new sales stages. 
which I think is working pretty well. We now have a pretty good idea of, of where things are in the sales cycle. Um, what is still not great is um, some rigor around close dates. Um, so um, we used to be a business that was very much um, inbound focus. Um, and what that meant is a very short sales cycle from um, inquiry to close. Um, as we're shifting to be both inbound and outbound, um, those sales cycles will elongate. And so it also means that we need better discipline about kind of our medium and long-term um, pipeline. So it used to be that it didn't really matter what the date was. It'll close in the next two months. Um, so I think close dates is kind of the next um, the next kind of phase of where we are now, even in terms of trying to give some better um, predictive metrics or, or some better sanity checks. Um, so the process right now is that on a weekly basis, um, managers are sitting down with reps and going through their list um, and coming up with a um, projection for where we'll finish in the month. Um, we don't actually do anything beyond the month. Um, so this quarter, we're shifting to both do monthly and quarterly forecasts. The dream is to be more, more long-term than that. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I say not great. Um, I say not great because from a sales ops perspective, it's not very scientific. But to give credit where credit is due, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> um, you know, we did some sales forecast accuracy reporting um, late last year. Um, the guys were pretty good. I, I frankly don't know how. Uh, maybe it was just a bit of luck. Um, certainly on our kind of SME business, it's very transactional. So um, as long as we're keeping an eye on activity, that should be actually pretty predictable. Um, but even from our kind of mid-market corporate businesses, maybe it was a stroke of luck. But, um, you know, they're really doing quite a manual deal by deal by deal with every single individual. Um, and sometimes that can be quite a long list. So I think what we're trying to help them do this year is is be a little bit less manual around that. So instead of having a Google sheet with a list of deals for this quarter, maybe it's a Salesforce report with some waiting and then we kind of do some tweaks. So. Got it. Awesome. Um, and then over the, uh, the 12 or so years exposure to sales metrics, if you had to only measure one for the rest of your sales ops career, which would you choose? That is a very good question. Um, I'm trying to think of an answer that doesn't actually have eight parts. So I'm kind of cheating. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I mean, I think for me, if you're going to look at kind of one thing, and I don't know if this is cheating or not, but um, I've always kind of worked at, you know, separating out whatever that target is into a lead plan. And so whatever those kind of stages are, um, let's say that there's leads, opportunities created and deals won to make it very simple. Um, looking and monitoring those things on a weekly, monthly basis um, will give you a pretty good idea of where things are stuck and where things are going well or not. Um, you know, they are, it's kind of combines some leading indicators with stuff at the top from some stuff that's happened. But if I had to kind of like look at one dashboard for the rest of my life, because I'm finding it very hard to kind of boil down to one metric, but one thing, one, I, I'd look at progress against our lean plan. So how many, you know, how many leads did it say I was meant to create this week? How many opportunities did it say I was meant to create this week? If we don't do that, then we're not going to deliver our February number. So for me, it would just be kind of monitoring that lead plan. Got uh, it. And, it, it, it. and so the dashboard you, you would want to see is for all reps, all SDRs, total number of leads, total number of opportunities over time. And so you can see how those numbers fluctuate and that's going to give you a very good idea as to whether you're going to hit the forecast. Well, I think for me, it's just like, what is that against target? So it's all well and nice to have a line graph saying these numbers are getting better or these numbers are getting worse. But I really want to know kind of like in January, I said I'd have this many leads and this many opportunities. And like, how are we tracking towards that? And and did we hit that? Um, yeah, it's it's for me, the trends are interesting. Um, but hopefully if you've done your plan right, it's actually kind of that, that you know, uh, achievement versus target. Got it. Awesome. And final question is, who uh, has influenced you the most in your sales ops career? Um, 
I think it's been some of the really great um, sales leaders that I have either worked for or, or um, you know, met through my networks. And I think there's a lot of kind of um, really inspirational people out there who have some really interesting ideas. There's some people who have really kind of seen it all. Um, I think for me that the balance between sales management and, and kind of like sales ops is, to me, it's like a Batman and, and Robin relationship. So Batman's clearly the senior person. They're in charge. You know, that's your kind of sales leader. Um, but hopefully Robin and kind of sales ops, like one, they can kind of fill in when Batman's not around. So forecast reviews don't really stop when, when a sales leader goes on holiday, much as sales reps would like to think otherwise. But they're also just kind of like, you know, those second pair of eyes telling them to watch out for things that maybe aren't on their mind. So like, hey, watch out, there's a baddie behind you. Hey, we've totally stopped looking at multi-year deals and they've gone down the tubes. So I think for me, it's those really kind of great relationships um, and people who have really kind of elevated me because they've seen it um, as a very important role. So, I mean, I wouldn't say that we're equals, but people who have really kind of elevated me to to say, hey, we can kind of both do this. I'm clearly in charge and you're helping me, but but we're both two pieces of this puzzle that can accomplish more. Got it. And do you have a, like a specific name of one that really has or, or have they all been really good? Um, one who I really in, enjoyed working with um, was, was Dick Cahill um, at Concentra, um, who's a really kind of seasoned um, sales leader who who, um, yeah, had a, had a good idea of what he wanted um, and a good idea of kind of um, also being very open to, to kind of, um, yeah, what else is there? Who else? Um, Nigel Syrett, who I worked with at Reval, was a really great person to, to both have a lot of great ideas, but also, you know, he was someone who anytime he had an idea, he wouldn't do it without running it past me. And would this work? And how would this? And would there be any issues? And how could we report on it? Um, and I think those people who have been kind of quite empowering as well have also allowed me to bounce my ideas off of them and, and kind of refine and get better. Got it. And which kind of Batman was Dick Cahill? Was he the more um, Christian Bale type or was he? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. All the, all, all the tricks. <laughs> <laughs> that, I, I, I do really like that analogy. Never heard that before. The Batman and Robin self-leadership slash sales operations analogy and shout out to Dick Cahill of Concentra um, for being the best Batman. Um, Marissa, thank you so much for that. There are three things that I want to quickly highlight that I really liked. Um, my, my favorite thing, I think, from the whole chat was your point about changing a process or changing something in operations is relatively easy. It's the people changing. That's the hard part. Um, I do agree that I think other SaaS companies or especially early stage companies can really benefit from some of the rigor of the change management that you obviously experienced at Accenture. Um, and the final thing, oh yeah, with obviously the Batman and Robin analogy. Um, so thank you so much for coming on. Before we do stop though, um, why would people in the audience want to come over to Sales Ops Help to check out what you're doing there? Uh, so I think what I've done is tried to add a few blogs around um, some of the common questions I get. Um, so things like, um, should my sales operations organization be on a commission goal and kind of thoughts around that? Or um, what does change management look like? And, and, you know, what types of scale changes need a proper business readiness? Um, and what actually should just be regular communication? So I've tried to take all those kind of um, common questions I get and uh, and distill them. I like to also blog about the things that kind of make me scratch my head um, that I that that the process almost forces me to think through it. So hopefully there's some easy um, easy advice there for everyone. Awesome. We'll link down below this video to Sales of Help. Marissa, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a very insightful session. Um, thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Tom.